Welcome to Video Vision. We had several talks uh, given uh, in the framework of plasma physics and one was uh, presented at the YouTube channel Urknall Welter Leben and this talk was presented by the director of the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics, Hartmut Sohm, and the talk was entitled Envisioning a Fusion Reactor. We also had another talk uh, given by the section leader of the ITER organization and his name is Richard A. Pitts and his talk was entitled ITER The Next Step. Nice to see so many young fresh faces uh, uh, at the summer school. Lots of potential future ITER employees I see here. <laughs> I also see a pr recent uh, uh, intern who was with us until a few, few weeks ago. Right? Good morning. So. Um, uh, Yes, Roberto is right. I work in the uh, Science and Operations Department at the ITER organization. This is the department in charge of, uh, well, operations, preparation for plasma, plasma operation, and includes all the scientists, all the physicists uh, on the project. So I am uh, in charge of a, a section which deals with plasma operation and experiments. And in the science division, there's a second section which deals with all the computational plasma physics things. Uh, and so uh, this morning I'm going to give you uh, a kind of very quick, uh, intense overview of the project, uh, some basic things about ITER, and then mostly uh, a, a, a look through all the different components that we have, and then at the end the current status of the project, where we are in terms of construction. So you've had a week of plasma physics, I think, from the colleagues at IPP and others. You're probably saturated with equations and stuff about plasmas. There will be no equations in my talk. You can relax. There will be lots of pictures. You can just take it easy uh, for the last day. Okay, so I'll try to go as quickly as I can. I have a rather large number of slides. I hope we can get through most of it. So sit back and enjoy the ride. So uh, the outline of the talk will be uh, I will talk a little bit about what ITER is, how it operates in terms of partnership, procurement sharing, and then we'll look at what determines the ITER scale, why it is the way it is, and then we'll go on to look at the individual major components which make up the machine, and finally uh, I'll say a little bit about the, the site as it stands uh, today. So a caveat, this project is very, very large by uh, several orders of magnitude, the largest fusion project I ever worked on and probably one of the largest uh, scientific projects in the world at the moment. Um, so I can only give you a brief flavor of what's going on there. I cannot possibly go into all the details in all the areas. This will be, not, this will be unsatisfactory to some people who may be more engineering, other people who are more physics who will want to know more, but I'm afraid we just don't have the time to go through in those details. So do forgive me for that before I start. So first of all, what is ITER? <coughs> well, this is an international collaboration in fusion energy. It involves all the partners that you see on the screen there. And you see the abbreviations, EU, CN, IN, etc. They, they will be cropping up in the talk uh, as we go along. These are the different abbreviations for the different partners. EU, China, India, Japan, Russian Federation, South Korea, and the US. So this is a partnership of these different uh, entities, these different countries. Europe, of course, is many countries. This is the European Union, and in that sense it's unique. All the others are single countries. Europe is the entity of all the European countries in the partnership. So the overall objective of the program is to demonstrate the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion energy for peaceful purposes, emphasis on peaceful, of course. Uh, lots of people have done fusion uh, in other ways that are not quite so peaceful, but our aim is only to generate, to demonstrate that electricity generation through the fusion, the controlled fusion process is possible, and to show the way for uh, future reactors to do that. Hartmut Zorn will speak to you this afternoon, I think, more on the, what comes after ITER and the prospects. The principal goal therefore is to design, construct, and operate a tokamak experiment at a scale which satisfies the objective of that. And ITER is designed to confine a deuterium tritium plasma in which alpha particle heating, that's a fusion product, the charged fusion product, uh, dominates all other forms of plasma heating. And this is therefore what we call a burning plasma experiment. That is actually the real difference between ITER and other devices that have used DT fuel in the past. So, some things about ITER and scale. 
So when you get to the eta scale, you get way beyond the human scale. This is not any more like working on a small tokamak or even a medium-sized tokamak like Aztec subgrade, where you can still clamber on the machine, you can still be bolting diagnostics, you can still feel the device. ITER is much, much bigger, completely inaccessible in a big concrete pit when it's finally operating. Once it goes nuclear, nobody goes anywhere near it. So it's a very, very different beast to what we've been used to. I did my PhD on very small machines and then bigger and bigger and finally arrived at the really big one. Uh, and there it's hands off, everything is, is just so much bigger. And it's very challenging to build something this big. Uh, challenging for industry because everything is so big, it's so almost first of a kind. Everything you want to put on this machine has really never been done before at the scale we need it. So it's very challenging. The cost of the project is a bit of a thorny issue, uh, comes up often politically and amongst people who are opposed to this kind of project. Uh, we will never really know how much it really costs because, as I will show you, the components are um, procured in kind by the partners for the most part. So India uh, agrees to deliver a cryostat, Europe agrees to deliver some toroidal field magnets, uh, South Korea agrees to deliver parts of the vacuum vessel. They sign up to deliver those components on a certain time scale to a certain quality and they pay for it. And we never know how much it costs them. But there is an overall intrinsic cost, which I will show you, and the real cost of the project will be higher than that, but how much higher is difficult to say. And the fact that it's very costly is difficult for politicians. Um, because, you know, persuading someone to spend a large amount of money on a project that takes so many decades to come to fruition is not so easy. So the time is about 15 years to build it and about 20 years to operate it according to the current plan, although this number could change. This is difficult for politicians again, and it's also difficult for people like us, because you start working on a project and you know, in my case, for example, that I will never see this project reach its final goals. However, you will. So if you're staying in the field and you work for the next decade or so, get yourself involved, get yourself qualified, you have the chance to be on the world's first DT fusion project, which demonstrates the feasibility of fusion energy for electricity generation. It's an extremely exciting time. I'm excited because I got to work on the project towards the end of my career, having started on a smaller machines and fusion or a big machine like this was just a distant objective, but there was no real certainty. Now we're building it. You have the certainty that you have the possibility to work on it uh, when it reaches its uh, main goals. Now, the maintenance periods on a machine like this will be difficult. They will be lengthy because it's a nuclear device. This can be difficult also for people working on the project. It means that we don't, won't be able to shut down many times. We won't be able to open this device many times because each time you do it is a major operation. And a device like this costs a lot of money to run it. So every day that you're shut down is a day where you can't be running the device, but you still have to pay for the device to be, uh, the plant to be there. And it's very complex. Highly integrated components built in different parts of the world, different continents. Uh, everything has to come together and fit. And this is very, very difficult to manage interfaces and to establish and enforce quality assurance in particular. You're often talking to people in different countries who see things in different ways with different protocols. But in the end, everything has to come together and fit. If it doesn't fit, you're in trouble, especially if it's a very big component that took a very long time to build. You can't just go back and build another one uh, without very large delays. Now, if we talk about construction sharing, like I said, a very unique feature of this project is that almost all of it, all of the machine itself, um, is constructed through in-kind uh, procurement from the different parties. Um, and so you see on the pie chart to the left, uh, the staff distribution as of uh, July this year. This is not the procurement distribution, but it's, it's an idea of who works at the project. And that should be in the split roughly of five to 11 for the EU and one to 11 for the other partners. But you can see that the EU has the large majority of the staff on the project. It should be about 40%, we're about 63. And this is simply because ITER is in Europe. So it's easier for Europeans to come and work, to, to move countries to live in France compared to living in Germany or England or wherever. Not so easy for the people in Southeast Asia, for example, for whom such a move is a really quite a big deal. 
the total intrinsic value of the project was 4585 KIUA. ITER is so important, we have our own currency. <laughs> so this is an ITER unit of a cant. And a KIUA is 1,000 of those. So um, if you do a calculation, this KIUA rate is updated each year for administrative and financial purposes. And uh, at the current rate uh, in 2019, the intrinsic value of the project, as it was envisaged when construction began, when the project was first uh, started up, was around 8 billion euros. Like I said, we won't know what the real cost is because we don't know exactly how much all the components cost. But this is how much the project was expected to cost. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how, how much more than that uh, it will be because I simply don't know. And I don't think it's the right thing for numbers to be bandied around without knowing what you're talking about because then people who don't like fusion or are opposed to it get hold of big numbers and start saying, oh, this project is 30 billion, 40 billion, 20 billion. I have seen so many different numbers for the cost of ITER in various journalistic reports that it's, uh, it's amazing how they come up with so many different numbers because we don't tell them anything. Who's building what? Here's the ITER machine. This is your first glimpse of the machine as a whole. Uh, we will come back to the details of it now. So you see that um, the major components are shared often between several partners, for example, the toroidal field coils. They are, if you include the cabling conduit, the superconducting cable, the casings, the winding packs, all of those things, you've pretty much got six of the partners involved. The vacuum vessel is three of the partners, so Europe, uh, South Korea, and, and Russia, for, as an example. The blanket is developed, bits of different bits of the blanket are contributed by four of the partners, diverter three, and so on. And so you see that there's a lot of procurement sharing around. These are very difficult, very challenging components. And part of the idea behind the project is that each of the different partners gets a piece of the action in, in as many of the big components as possible. Why? It's obvious, because they want to learn how to build them. They want to exercise their industry. They want to be able to build their own reactors in the longer term, should ITER demonstrate that such a thing is feasible. And because they're an ITER partner and they contribute financially and in kind, they all have the rights to the intellectual property rights to the machine. Every single party gets the full build-to-print design of the, of the machine and in principle could then use it to build their own. Even if they are themselves not contributing to some components, they have the right to see how all of the components are, are developed and built. So it's a very important aspect of the project that simply financially it's very difficult for a single nation to build this machine on their own simply because it's hard to get from any given government this kind of money. So it's better to put your resources together, but importantly is you, you put them together to enable you to build it, but at the same time everybody who's building it learns how to build all of it. And I think that's a very attractive and important aspect of the ITER project. So ITER is primarily an experiment, but it's also a major technology test bed. This you should not forget. We are not building a device to do fancy physics with here, although we will be doing lots of fancy physics. We're building a device that does engineering, that tests components that will be required at the reactor scale. As Hartmut will doubtless tell you, ITER is not much smaller than a reactor, depending on how you want to build it. And ITER can actually be a lot bigger than some reactor designs, depending on which design you choose. So there are many different ways to go about tokamak fusion. ITER is just one line, it's the most shall we say, the line we know most about. It's, it's not a surprise that ITER is the way it is because it's based on devices of this nature but at smaller scale that have been running for decades. It's our biggest knowledge base, so it's unsurprising we try to build a big one that is based on all that we know about the smaller ones, but there are other ways to do it. But one thing about ITER is it's very big. It has to be big, and I'll show you uh, a, bit a bit more about that later. It's a very, very important step towards a demo. Um, you could not, I believe, build a demo reactor on the scale that you need to make electricity or to generate lots of fusion power without going through this phase first. And anyone who's worked on ITER, like I have for the last 11 years, can, can cite you hundreds, literally, of examples of why it would have been difficult to go straight to demo because we had to overcome so many difficulties to get where we are with this one. And, and a demo is so much bigger. And, and if you make mistakes at that scale, it's, uh, it's very hard because you're trying to produce something that generates long pulse fusion power and to reach that goal without having an earlier step where you learn 
to get over all the obstacles, uh, I think would be very risky. So let's talk about the ETA scale and the operational regime. This is very, very quick uh, and very simple, don't worry. So here's the machine again. This is actually a 2013 CAD render of the whole device, but the device is the same as what you see here. Um, and you see the, the, the vacuum vessel, you see the toroidal fuel coils, you see the big cryostat, the central solenoid, big vacuum pumps here, cryo pumps <coughs> at the diverter level to exhaust particles coming out of the plasma big port structures which allow you to insert your heating systems, to insert your diagnostics, your gas injection systems and so on. Um, basically the same as any other tokamak but just exceedingly large. Uh, large in the sense that it's 30 meters high if you go from the bottom of the cryostat to the top and the major radius which you're all familiar with, one of the most important dimensional parameters of, of a tokamak in terms of plasma physics, uh, major radius is about 6 meters, actually 6.2 meters. Uh, from the center of the central solenoid to the center of the vacuum vessel or the center of the plasma. Um, and you see down there a little man, just in that little, uh, in that little, I don't my mouse isn't working, there he is down there. So he's about to scale. So you see how small he is compared to the rest. I'm not, I don't show these things to, so you'll be super impressed about how big this machine is. Oh, it's huge and it's really big. And it, That's not the point. The, the fact is it has to be that big to do what it needs to do. And uh, when you see the scale, the scale of a human being compared to this thing, you realize just how much bigger it is compared to our ordinary experience. Um, and he's standing next to a, just an, a, an ordinary diverter cryo pump, which is the size of a big garage for your car. And if you look at these things on smaller devices, they fit in your car. <laughs> and now you've got to have a building to fit one in, and there are six of those on the machine. And they are unique new cryo pump designs which have been developed for a long time, many years, just for the ITER project. So you take the principles you know, but you upscale and you have to do new things when you upscale. So the design goals, as I told you, produce a significant fusion power amplification factor. We all know what capital Q is, don't we? Yes. One of the first things you have to learn about Tokamaks, uh, fusion machines. And it has to do it in long pulse. That's one of the keys. Most tokamaks to date, until the advent of the superconducting devices you start to see around the world, the East tokamak in China, K-Star in South Korea, the West machine in France, the new JT60 super advanced tokamak coming in Japan, they are starting to get longer pulse because they're superconducting. But until then, tokamaks are usually of relatively short pulse length. Uh, the key here is that ITO has to develop, has to de de demonstrate high Q in long pulse. And a secondary goal is to go to what we call an advanced steady state mode of operation where your fusion gain is lower, but your pulse length is much longer. So the standard um, DT plasma that with the baseline we aim for is about 500 seconds. And the steady state at lower Q, Q capital Q, uh, is around 3,000 seconds. So we're getting up to one hour pulse length. And, uh, and there is a very clear, clear a very, a very, um, uh, there is, a, there is a clear possibility that ITER could produce higher fusion gains than we currently predict. If confinement is favorable compared to what we know today, uh, it's quite possible that Q might be higher than 10, which is our aim. In which case, you start to get closer to values that reactors need. Reactors need capital Qs, 30, 40, something like that. They will not you know, reach infinity, you don't want the reaction to be uncontrolled, you want some handle on it, so you don't want very, very large capital Qs for a reactor, but you certainly need many tens. ITER is not designed to go beyond Q equals 10 according to our current baseline, but it, you never know, we might be lucky. In terms of technology, we have to demonstrate integrated operation of technologies for a fusion power plant, that's what I told you before, it's very important. We need to test all those components required. We can test to a certain extent, but there's one thing ITER cannot do, which demos will do, and that's neutron fluence. We will not be able to run long enough, enough plasma for long enough to develop the neutron fluence that you need to test materials at the reactor scale. So for example, the ITER blanket at the end of lifetime is probably going to be exposed to something of the order of 1 to 2 dPa displacements per atom whereas demos are 10 to 20 or something like that, if I remember rightly. So we can't get to the point where you really have tested a component as it will behave under very high neutron fluence, which is very important. 
Um, but there are many other components that we're testing that will be exactly the same as you need in a power plant. And uh, importantly at the bottom, where ITER has to try and test concepts for uh, breeding of tritium. And we'll come back to the tritium issue later in the, in the talk. So most of you will have seen this curve on the right hand side, very famous curve. Um, giving you uh, the fusion product, the N density times confinement time of energy times ion temperature, N tau T. You presumably learned about this in the week up to now. This is the kind of uh, progress plot. As you see how fusion has improved over the years and uh, the dates from 65 up to, this is an old plot been going up and up and up and you see that ITER situates itself above the QDT of one line uh, and so this tells you where, what fusion triple product you need to reach the conditions to reach your Q equals 10, your fusion power divided by input power. Now, existing experiments have run with DT, so the jet machine in the UK, the TFTR, the Tokamak Fusion Test Reactor in Princeton, in the 90s, they ran DT plasma and they were able to demonstrate effective Qs around one, um, but for very short times. So a second, <coughs> two seconds, one and a half seconds. Uh, and this is due in largely to the fact that these are short pulse devices. They were not superconducting. They had not uh, water-cooled components inside the vessel, so they simply could not do long pulse. Uh, but you see that ITER tries to go an order of magnitude bigger than Q of one, and it wants to go very, very high in time. So for the baseline scenario, four to 500 megawatts compared to 10 on these earlier devices, and up to 10 minutes of pulse length. So these are huge steps in performance. It might not seem like much to you, but they're very, very large steps. And uh, this is why ITER is so complex. Now, um, the reference scenario for Q equals 10, you all heard about the type one Elming H mode, yes? So this is the high confinement mode. Um, ITER would not reach anything like high Q without H mode. It is predicated on the H mode, on forming the transport barrier at the edge to increase the energy confinement. So uh, there's no reason for us to expect that H mod does not happen on ITER since it happens on every other machine like it that we have built, provided you have enough input power. Um, and so you see the scaling here. This is the thermal energy confinement time on the y-axis against um, the scaled uh, confinement time from these very large number of experiments over the, inside the fusion community over the decades. And when you scale them in this particular way, you see everything lines up uh, in this nice straight line, and uh, that ITER um, will be up there. And that red point in terms of thermal energy confinement time is what you need in that fusion triple product for the ion temperatures in the core of the ITER plasma to achieve uh, Q equals 10. And we're talking about energy confinement times of the order of three and a half seconds. And you see an interesting thing about the energy confinement time is that it scales like the plasma current multiplied by the square of the major radius multiplied by one over the input power to the two thirds. And that's why ITER is as big as it is. You need big current, 15 mega amperes, and you need large size, 6.2 meters. And until you get big current, big size, you don't get the energy confinement time you need for Q equals 10. There are other ways of going uh, along this curve and getting to where you need to go. One particular way is to use very high magnetic field. You can make the device more compact, but um, according to our conventional knowledge and the fact that we built many of these devices of this type of dimension with this type of uh, uh, operation mode, type one Elming H mode, uh, this is the safest, most risk-free way to go. Scale everything, it's like a wind tunnel experiment. Right? We, don't, we can't predict from first principles what the ITER confinement time is because that's determined by very complex turbulent transport processes. We're not at the point where we can just write down an equation or run a computer code and say, here you are, uh, ITER will, will have three and a half seconds of energy confinement time. So what you do is you build smaller, bigger, 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 measure a set of parameters on, on each machine that are the same and scale them together and see where ITER would sit. So uh, it's a little bit you know, shaky in the sense that we can't prove from first principles, computational, that this is where ITER will, the ITER will sit where it needs to sit, but we are pretty sure. Now, uh, this factor of P to the minus two thirds, where P is the input power, that's the worrying thing. The energy confinement time scales gets worse as you put more power in. 
And the other worrying thing is that the H mode threshold is dependent on power. So the, the, the ease with which you can jump into this high confinement mode depends on the power that's crossing your last magnetic surface. And one of the things that's on, a little bit difficult about ITER is that it's a bit underpowered in the sense that if you want good energy confinement in this H mode, you need to be I say, two to three times above the threshold for the power in which you, into which you get, in which you get into H mode, at which you get into H mode, excuse me. So if you really want a good, solid, type one Elming H mode with good energy confinement, you would like as much power as possible. And today's devices, small devices like Aztecs, like uh, uh, devices similar to Aztecs, even like JET, when they have their full power in, they're many times above the threshold for the H mode transition. ITER needs alpha particles to stay well above the threshold. We don't have enough additional heating power to jump into H mode and be clean into H mode. We need the alpha particles to switch on, the fusion process to switch on, so that the energy starts to come back out, and then that keeps us above the uh, H mode threshold. So it's a, it's a bit unique in that sense. You can't just dial up power and say and jump bang into H mode where you want to be. You have to wait for the alphas to keep you in there. But we have done lots of calculations about this. We're quite confident that it will be okay. But it does mean that you have less flexibility in this device. Things like radiating power out and keeping energy exhaust at the edge to manageable levels. You cannot radiate too strongly in the main plasma to, to, to drop that radiation because then you get too close again to this back transition into the low confinement mode. Bigger reactors, demos, have a little bit more flexibility to radiate power in the main plasma, uh, but the problem is that they absolutely need that flexibility or they will not cope with the energy uh, coming out to the edges. So ITER sits in this sort of halfway house where power flux management at the edge is, is possible according to all of our models and our understanding in the way in which it is done uh, today. But uh, demo jumps to another level where you need to radiate much more power and then there's this fine balance between how much you're allowed to radiate in the main chamber and so on. Keep the plasma contamination low if you're using seated impurities and so on. So, how is ITER different for physics and tokamak operation? Well, it's self-heated by alpha particles, which is what I told you before. That means there's a non-linearity in the total heating power due to the dependence on the plasma profiles themselves. MHD is different. You have Sawtooth stabilization by fast alpha particles, which is not something that's easy to find in today's machines, means that the saw teeth, the period between the MHD crashes in the core of the plasma can get incredibly long. And then when it crashes, that's a big crash. So you have to manage that. Um, you have fast particle modes, alpha in modes, which you don't see uh, so easily in smaller machines. And all of this, we have good handles on a lot of it, but there are certain things that we will not know until we build this machine. Plasma control is very challenging on ITER. Um, you need to control position of the plasma, shape, fueling, heating, stability, exhaust, all of those things all the time uh, and don't make too many mistakes because if you do and you lose control of this plasma it can be extremely damaging for the components around the plasma. Um, you, you have difficulties in the sense that plasma position control is much slower than on smaller devices because of penetration times of fields through the vacuum vessel and so on. So you can't react as quickly to certain things as you can on smaller devices. And because it's so powerful, this machine, if you make any mistake and your plasma suddenly finds itself sitting on the wall, you have a very short amount of time to get it back off. And you can't get it back off very quickly. So basically you have to keep the plasma stable in position for, uh, you know, to the most robust uh, uniform, uh, so we say, um, you, don't want to, you don't want to be in a position where you, you're on stability boundaries where you could lose control easily. You have to find and keep the plasma um, where it needs to be without allowing too much uh, flexibility. It's a very complex control matrix uh, to, to run this plasma. It's a very high ion fluence, so the, the particles coming out of this plasma and depositing on surfaces around the machine the fluence, the total number of particles per square meter over the lifetime of the device is orders of magnitude higher than anything we can do in today's machines, tokamaks. And so there's all kinds of things that can happen to materials potentially that we are unable to, to be sure about today because we simply cannot make those exposures. It's changing now because there are linear plasma devices uh, operating, one in uh, Eindhoven, the Magnum PSI machine, which can reach the ITER lifetime fluence, but on very, very small samples. 
in the same way that if you can do neutron t neutronic testing, at the kind of demo levels of neutrons that you need, fluences, you can only do it on small samples. You have no idea how a much bigger device would behave. You have to extrapolate. And a very key thing about ITER is it has very high stored energy. Stored energy goes like somewhere between R cubed and R to the power of five, depending on confinement. So uh, if you've got a big major radius, you have a very big stored energy. So, but ITER's baseline at Q equals 10 has a stored energy in the plasma of about 350 megajoules. And you can imagine if you lose 350 megajoules quickly on a short time scale and that makes its way to a localized focused area of the first wall, it can cause a lot of damage. There are also huge disruption forces when the plasma current collapses. There are massive forces on the blanket surrounding the plasma and then on the vacuum vessel. And those are actually very dangerous things because if you start to mechanically damage your vacuum vessel uh, or your blanket, then you're, you're in principle, uh, uh, you're starting to threaten the containment capability of your device. So that's a very important safety issue. The, the vacuum vessel is the primary confinement barrier, the containment barrier of the machine from the point of view of safety. And another thing that happens in disruptions when you lose the plasma energy quickly is that you can start to generate runaway electrons. Because the electric fields are very strong in the plasma at the collapse, and any free electrons that start to accelerate uh, quickly you know, pull themselves out of the main distribution and start to form very, very intense high current beams with MeV of energy. So a 15 megaampere plasma can have a runaway beam at 10 megaamperes at 10 MeV or more. So these things, if they hit a surface, it's, it's, it's like a, a very powerful electron beam and it can start to you know, tunnel into surfaces and create nasty things like water leaks because ITER is fully water-cooled uh, for its first well. And the last thing you would like on a nuclear device is a water leak because then you have water coming out, you have tritium all over the place, you have all kinds of problems, and you have to shut down for a long time to fix it. So we have to control it, run away electron beams. And so these, I highlight this to tell you that there is a huge program on ITER which has started up uh, in the last year or two, uh, a special task force to equip the machine with uh, a very sophisticated disruption mitigation system. This is a way in which we will provide a last line of defense to make sure that if this plasma is going to disrupt and there's nothing we can do about it, that we will make the consequences of the disruption as, uh, as shall we say, tolerable as possible. And, uh, there, I can't go into much detail, but we're devising systems. This is an example that's in one of the equatorial port plugs of the machine, where there are multiple barrels firing cryogenic <laughs> pellets into the plasma. Argon, neon, argon plus deuterium, neon plus deuterium, deuterium, to build up the density to the point where the runaway beam cannot develop, or in the case of argon, kill the runaway beam if it's formed, before it does any damage to dissipate the thermal quench energy when the plasma collapses and all the energy comes out to the main walls, hit the plasma with a pellet of neon so that you radiate all of that energy into photons and spread the energy all over the machine walls rather than allowing the magnetic configuration to, to drive that energy along field lines to specific interaction areas on the machine. And this is a very large task force. It involves multiple partners around the world. It's a very expensive um, piece of kit. Aztec Operate is now joined in and will itself uh, be installing uh, what we call a shattered pellet injector. You see it up there, SPI. This is the way we see to do disruption mitigation on ITER now, where you, if you fire a pellet in along a tube, you have a plate, the pellet hits the plate and shatters into lots of small pellets, cryogenic pellets, and then dis assimilates into the plasma and tries to radiate away all this energy or stop the runaway beam or uh, prevent the beam from forming. And it's a very big task, it involves multiple partners and it will, it will take many years to develop, but we're starting to see now that there is a path forward. But it's one of those areas that is not as well known and understood as we would like, and we don't have much time to, to put it into place. But at least now we've got a very defined structure to do that. Now going back to how ITER is different, well, routine operation at high Q means operating near design limits. It is a bit different to other machines in the sense that it really has to operate at the top end of its performance to reach its goals. There's not a lot of headroom above it. So we build this big device and we have to push it hard to get where it wants to go um, all the time. And so 
we can regularly exceed all the technological limits of our actively cooled plasma facing components. So if we make any mistakes, we melt or we cause water leaks, we shut the machine down, we have to fix it, it's all very expensive. So you've got to be very careful about control and you need then a very robust protection system to make sure that you don't make too many mistakes. Um, it's a nuclear device and that's very important. There are tritium and neutrons involved. So you have problems of retaining fuel inside the vessel, getting buried by co-deposition or implantation in components. You have the problem of tritium reprocessing because there isn't much of it. You can't afford to waste tritium, for one. And secondly, the nuclear authorities force you into so much, uh, um, so, so much safety regulation that you, you, you have no room for manoeuvre. Every, almost every atom has to be accounted for. And so there's a very big reprocessing uh, issue. Uh, there's the issue of tritium breeding, which we need to test. And don't forget, once it goes nuclear, you can't touch it anymore. So if you need to fix anything in this vacuum vessel, you need a robot. So you have to design and develop all those robots. And we have done lots of work in the fusion community on robots over the years. But still, this is a much bigger step up. Um, and in, in all devices that use robotics today, there's a robot in there doing its thing, controlled by somebody outside, you know, and all very sophisticated. But if something goes wrong, then you send a man in, or a woman, excuse me, to fix it. Whereas in ITER, if it doesn't work, you can't send anybody in there. At least uh, not anybody who wants to live for very long. So you have to make sure that those uh, remote handling tools are 100% reliable, and you can only use remote handling. You have a problem with dust, which I won't go into today, but I've given several hours over the years of lectures on dust inventory and the problems of dust in, in Tokamaks. Um, we have issues with diagnostic design because it's not so simple as it is on current devices just to put a diagnostic on. I'll show you later how, how we have to do that. And you have problems with toroidal fuel coil heating because the neutrons, well, the vacuum vessel and the blanket don't stop all of the neutrons. Some of them escape out and they heat up the superconducting uh, toroidal fuel coils, and you can't heat up those coils much uh, above their operating temperature before they lose their superconductivity, before you hit the critical temperature. And then the final point, which is very boring, but it's very important, is licensing. This is a nuclear plant. It has to be licensed as any nuclear plant. And we were on that for a long time, even before the ITER organization was properly formed, the licensing files were being built up to present to the authority that would host the project, in our case now it's France, and it's a very, very long, very arduous, complicated job. But it was done uh, already. This is a, 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 an old slide. But um, after all that work on the 19th of September, uh, the commission set forth to examine the nuclear safety case for ITER, finally decided that it was OK. And here you see aimé un avis favorable in French, which means, yes, OK, the regulatory body, body says this project is OK. We believe the safety case has been made properly and we grant the license to operate the device. And so on the 10th of November 2012, the French government published their decree 2012-2048, which authorizes the creation of the ITER nuclear facility. And so we are now an, um, we are now an installation nucléaire de base, INB, and we have the number 174. So we're an official nuclear plant. Now, as soon as you become an official nuclear operator, the whole weight of the regulatory body falls upon you and you have to make an awful lot of, uh, you have to do an awful lot of work to ensure that you keep satisfying all of their criteria for a nuclear plant. Security at just the gates to get in, the way you zone the plant so that no more, not more than a certain amount of tritium is in any particular building or one particular location at any time and so on. It's endless, the safety uh, dossier for ITER. So let's um, take uh, um, a brief tour through the major ITER components. So now it's much more pictorial and easy and uh, less, less technical detail. Um, so let's start with the magnet systems. Nearly 10,000 tons of superconducting magnets on this device. So this is niobium-3 tin and niobium titanium. The niobium-3 tin is for the toroidal fuel coils and the central solenoid where the field, the magnetic field is much higher the cell field in the coil. You need niobium-3 tin in our current uh, technology capability to do that. For the poloidal field coils, the, uh, the, um, the big ones on the outside you see here, you can use niobium-titanium because this, the field in these coils is much lower. 
Um, but still, uh, it's a very, very big magnetic field system, magnet system. It's highly complex in terms of all the feeders that you need to, to, to bring the current into the coils. Remember, you have to go from an outside power supply, which is at room temperature, an ordinary power supply, and you have to get your current into a superconducting coil at liquid helium temperatures. And so you need a lot of tech just to, to be able to do that. And you have a very large stored energy in these magnets, 50 gigajoules of stored energy. So you have to be very careful about quenching and things like that. It's incredibly sophisticated. But there are smaller tokamaks operating today with superconducting coil systems. They have done all this, but at a much smaller scale. So the technology is there. It's just a question of scaling it up. And if you want to see, um, if I go back to this, this, these feeder systems, these are the systems, again, that bring the power into the coils. You see how they go in to holes at the bottom of the cryostat of the machine. These things are captive components. Once you put them in and then put your machine on top, you can't get to them anymore, ever. So you have to make sure they work, because if they don't work, then suddenly you can't put, put current in your coils anymore. And you can see an example here. We will get to more pictures like this later. This is the, the, this is the tokamak pit. This is the bioshield of the machine. And you see them dropping in one of these coil feeders, these poloidal field coil feeders. This was just a few months ago. So these first captive components are going in there. And you see down here, in it goes, in there, in one of those holes at the bottom of the, of the bioshield. That thing there is fully inaccessible after the machine goes in. So everything has to be right for the lifetime of the machine. So going back to the magnet systems, this is just a, a kind of more technical drawing of the things. And I want to point out to the, the four major systems, so the toroidal field coils, the central solenoid, the poloidal field coils, uh, the main poloidal field coils, and then the CC. Anybody know what the CC are? Correction coils. But why? Why does ETA need correction coils? Why does any tokamak need them? Now, the correction coils play no role in shaping, but they're there because these big magnet systems, the TF, the, C, the, the, the PF, and so on, they, they're not perfect. They're not exactly in the place where you design them to be. They're not built perfectly. So they generate small errors in the, in the confining field that you're trying to make. And those small errors need to be offset, cancelled out, corrected. Because if you don't, the plasma is very sensitive to them, and you can start to develop all kinds of nasty MHD instabilities. So you correct them by backing off in those correction coils, the currents that are needed to annul, null out the imperfections in the toroidal, in the magnetic field of the machine. You see at the top the purple coils, there's a set of top coils, underneath here a set of bottom coils, and then there are some really big main coils running around the outside of the machine that you can't very easily see in this picture. Uh, you can just see them, those purple bits just above here. And so there's a, it's pretty standard stuff, correcting Tokamak error fields. Uh, but on ITER, they're very much bigger, that's the problem. And they are superconducting because they have to be permanently there. You have to null out these fields all the time. Um, so let's move on to the toroidal field coils. Here's um, one of the toroidal field coil casings. It looks pretty innocuous and small on this picture, but it actually weighs 360 tons and it's 16 meters high and 9 meters across. And the most challenging TF coil that's ever been built for a tokamak. Um, so we have 19 of those. There are 18 coils on ITER and one spare. And they are being built by the European Union and by Japan. And we'll go into a little bit more detail. So um, if you look at a Boeing 747, at uh, maximum takeoff weight is about the same as one of these beasts. And we have 18 of those. So just a word about niobium-3 tin superconductor procurement. To show you the, the influence that the ITER project has had in one particular area, there are others. Um, when we started to procure the superconducting strand, these are the cabling conduits that make up the toroidal field coil pancakes, which are inside the casings that I just showed you. We'll, we'll look at those in a minute. Um, when it started, um, we needed about 100,000 kilometers of this, this material. And before we started, they were making about 15 tons per year worldwide. And, uh, and it had to ramp up to about 100 tons a year for ITER worldwide, just to be able to make these coils, central solenoid and toroidal field. And we have lots of different suppliers from six of the domestic agencies of ITER and produced 2,800 tonnes of it at an estimated total value of around 600 million euros. So how do you build these things? Well, here's an, an old picture from uh, 2011 now where you see one of the radial plates that make up the toroidal field cores, and these are all stacked up. And these are the things that allow you to guide the superconducting cable and situate it in a very precise location. 
So you basically wind your superconducting cable into these radial plates, you stack them all up, you impregnate them with resin, you make a winding pack, you seal that, and you put it all in the case, and then deliver the case to the machine. That's your toroidal fuel coil. And these things are incredibly precise. The machining precision on these is, is quite breathtaking and has been achieved. And all of these radial plates are now manufactured at various places. So that was just an old picture to show you. That's actually a prototype. It wasn't even the real one. They were just practicing. And then when you've got your superconducting cable, you have to heat it because it doesn't become superconducting until you bake it to a very high temperature. Um, so you're reacting the tin and the niobium together. And this is an example of the baking facility in Japan, because Japan is supplying uh, half of the TF coils, Europe is supplying the other half. You see the scale of the thing you need just to bake the cable to make the superconductor. So you have to build all this kit simply to get to the, the stage of being able to fabricate these things. Um, and so after uh, a few years, on the 17th of January in 2017, the Japanese finished their first toroidal field coil winding pack. You see all these people stood in the middle. That's the team that did it. Uh, okay, you can see how big the coil is. You can fit large numbers of people inside one of these coils. Um, this was completed at, at the Mitsubishi plant and operations are going elsewhere, also in Toshiba. So as I said before, Japan supplies nine of these, EU 10, which makes 18 plus one spare. And then, not to be undone, the Europeans, of course, are running along in parallel because you have to have all these coils coming, not all together, but pretty closely spaced in time if you want to assemble this machine. So here you see an example of the Europeans where they have stacked up their seven superconductor, their seven pancakes together that are, that are made up of this cable wound into these um, radial plates. And so you see again the scale of these things is very impressive. And then finally when you've finished that, then you have to uh, um, wind it all up into a, 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 a full winding pack, which then becomes the thing that you insert into the toroidal field casings. And uh, you see the team of people who did that uh, uh, down there. So that was on, in May 2017. And you also need to test these things, right? Because you want to see that they behave okay when you get them cold. Uh, and this was a, a long debate in the ETHER project amongst the, ETHER, the IO, the organization and the partners, about whether or not we really should cold test these coils down to their superconducting temperature. And that's a very expensive thing to do. And it was decided finally to cold test only to liquid nitrogen temperatures to 80 Kelvin. But of course, you still need to build a very big piece of kit to do that. And that's being done in Japan and Europe. Uh, so at least you know how the coil behaves when it gets down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. Now, the casing is the thing I showed you in the first picture. That's one that was finished uh, in the summer of, near the summer of last year. And uh, this is the thing into which you insert the winding pack that you've made with your double pancakes of superconducting cable. And uh, this was the first one. And this is also an extremely challenging object because the precision that you have to machine this thing down to is sub-millimetric. And uh, a lot of people, I think, thought that wasn't possible, but it turns out that it is. And it has been done. And so uh, this is the first one that was produced uh, in Japan. And actually, Japan provides all of those. So it's building itself nine of the TF winding packs, but it's producing all of the casings. And uh, uh, some of that is, if you like, subcontracted out to South Korea. So it's a kind of Southeast Asian collaboration. But Japan is the main partner supplying the coils. And there you see um, a, a third one. So the first one is the one I showed you behind. This is the third one that was, uh, that was issued out this year in April. So we already have three of these full TF coils. And as I will show you later, you only need two to start your assembly because you've got a vacuum vessel with nine sectors. Each sector carries two coils. And so you, you install your vacuum vessel sector by sector in the tokamak pit. So as soon as you've got one vacuum vessel sector and two coils, you can start building the first part of your nine sectors. And we'll see that later. So this is um, uh, the first coil that has been completed. This is in Japan. It was March this year. And now you see the whole coil case. And inside there is now a winding pack. So everything has been done at least once. One coil is complete. You see, actually, that the Japanese do theirs vertically, whereas the Europeans are going to do it flat. And this also has caused quite a lot of discussion in the project um, about the differences that this produces. For example, one of the key things I told you earlier about aerofields, you, you have a big winding pack that's done to high precision, 
but you've impregnated it, you've heated it up, you've put resin in there, you've put all of that in a case, and, and then it's a very, very big thing, and it bows under its own weight. And you've got to transport that from Japan to Cadarache in France. And, and all the while it's doing that, things may be settling in that case, and that winding pack may not be exactly where you think it is. In fact, we know that we won't know exactly where it is. So the imprecision of where the coils are with respect to the casing translates to an imperfection in your knowledge about what the field will be. And so there are some very detailed studies we are doing now to investigate what the consequence of not knowing exactly where the coils are, the magnetic field source is, um, in, the, in the machine, and what consequences that will have for error fields and for alignment of your first wall because your blanket, your first wall, has to be aligned to high precision compared to the plasma. And if uh, you don't get that alignment quite right, you can get some nasty heat loads in excess of what you can tolerate. So we're doing quite a lot of study on that now. Now, the central solenoid is a very large stack of six independent powered modules. Um, you see that a key point here is the 13 Tesla peak field, which is why you need the niobium 310. It's very heavy, it's 1,000 tons biggest central solenoid by far ever built for any talking about. I have this uh, interesting little um, animation that someone gave me. I can't decide, I can't tell you all the details because I'm not an expert. You see one solenoid, two, three, four, five, six, and then all those things have to be pushed together, bound together by these tension bars, and then finally the feet added so that then you can connect it to your, to your vessel. It's an incredibly complex structure. And if this doesn't work, your Takamak's finished. And moreover, when it's in there and connected, that's it. You don't get it out again. So it has to be lifetime and it has to be okay. And this is, of course, superconducting. So the first module, this is being built in the US at General Atomics in San Diego. Uh, the first of the, six, of the six central solenoid modules is now complete. And you see it sitting here in this um, jig, this structure, which allows it to be moved around, manipulated, because now they've got to start testing. But this is a major milestone that the first one is ready. And the others are all in various states of fabrication. It's not that we build one and then build the other five. They're building them all in series, but this is the first one to be complete. Um, now onto the poloidal field coils. Um, so this is uh, a CAD render again. You see the yellow PF coils. These are very spectacular coils because they're so big. Yeah? And um, they're, they're like 25 meters in diameter for the two big ones in the middle. And they reach a 7 Tesla peak cell field, so not as high as the 13 Tesla you need on the TF coils or the uh, central solenoid. So they're so big that we're man manufacturing this one, the two in the middle, and the, and the one you see nearly at the top. All of those are being built at ETA in a special winding facility, which I'll show you in a moment. The top, the top one, you can just see the top of, that's PF1, and the bottom one underneath here, which you can't see, PF6, they're being built outside and they're going to be uh, delivered to the ETA site because they're, they're small enough to be transported by road. The other ones, there's just no chance. So we have to build them on site. So um, there's an example of one of the double pancakes. I showed you those for the toroidal field coils. Well, it's exactly the same concept for the poloidal field coils. This is PF1 at the top. This is being made in Russia. Actually, it's being fabricated, if I remember rightly, on a barge. They're already building it on the system they will be able to transport it on. And uh, so this one is, uh, this is an example of one of the double pancakes. Uh, I think there are nine of those in each of the two smaller coils. Uh, in China, who is building PF, um, uh, PF6, the, the bottom coil, um, there again, this is a photograph from last, early last year, where they were at roughly the same stage as the, uh, the Russian colleagues. Um, and of course, this is two different fabrications, two different teams but building the same coil to the same dimensions and the same performance. And now we skip forward to June this year, so it's very recent. This PF6 coil, this is in China at uh, uh, ASIPP in Hefei, uh, this thing is ready. They went very, very quickly. And uh, so this gigantic coil, which is the smallest one on ETA, is fully built. And I just heard from our magnet guys that they're shipping it next week from China. It has to go perilously close to Iran, which is a bit worrying at the moment. Um, so I hope they don't choose to pick on that particular ship uh, because, uh, yeah, hope not. We don't want to lose this because the, imagine the delay if you have to build another one. 
And this one's very important because it's the one that goes in first at the bottom. See on the top plot there, PF6? That's the one you put right at the bottom of the machine. So by definition, it's the first one in. So you have to have it ready first. The others can be a bit later because they're coming in afterwards. So talking about the others, I told you that we needed to wind these things ourselves. So you see this enormous hall. I remember when I joined the ITER organization 11 years ago, that hall wasn't there. In fact, nothing was there. And then shortly after, a couple of years later, the hall appeared. It was the first building up. And it was empty. <laughs> there was nothing in it, but it was a bloody big building. I remember standing at the end of it going, oh, yeah, there's about four five-a-side football pitches in here, or maybe a golf driving range or something like that. Sadly, it was filled up with winding stuff uh, shortly afterwards. This building went up quickly because architecturally, by today's techniques, very easy to build these big buildings, and it's non-nuclear. Very important, because nuclear buildings are much harder to build uh, and they require a lot more planning. So it was one of the first ones up, and you can see in here now all the different bits of kit, winding facilities, then impregnation facilities, then putting in case facilities, all kinds of steps as these coils move along the production line all in super clean conditions and uh, very very impressive to see this if you ever come to the ITER site uh, and go on a tour when they take you in this building it's very impressive when you see it for the first time um, so now uh, resin impregnation uh, of the double pancakes is now on uh, of, of the, the full system is now ongoing for pf coil five so that's the uh, if you look on the plot at the top it's the first the, the sort of the, the next biggest one after PF6. So that was obviously the first one you go for because that's the one that goes in after PF6, you need PF5. And, uh, and now they've started work on uh, number two, which is the next big one, the next biggest big one from the top. So when you've done the first one, you know how to build the second one, and then you attack the really big ones later. So just a, a zoom in on the winding facility. I was fascinated by this thing when I first saw it. It's an incredible piece of tech. The way that they, they have these big, uh, you see the spool at the top there, the big silver thing, and there's another one on this side which you can't see. And then this thing is, is literally taking superconducting cable in conduit and just winding it round off the spool to astonishing precision. Because obviously as, as you go around and you make more and more of the coil, you're at different radius each time. So all these machines have to be precision controlled to make sure they feed at the right speed so that you bend at different rates. It's absolutely incredible. And these are one of a kind. You build this kind of winding facility for this particular application. You can't really use it for anything else. Um, it's just a pity that we can't make more eaters now because we have all the kit. Um, and you see here now, much later on, this is March 2019, so it's this year, you see a, a close-up of the full uh, impregnated double pancakes for PF5. And you see even now the liquid helium feeders that are transferring the, the, the coolant from one pancake to the next. That's an incredibly difficult operation as well to make sure all of that's right because you can't fix it after. When you put the coil in its case, put it on the machine, you can't get to these things anymore. It all has to be lifetime. Now, yeah, we talked about correction coils. These are being built in China at ASIPP. And you see the photograph of uh, one of the first of, uh, of the, I think it's, uh, did I write it? Yeah, the bottom coil, so the, the bottom set of correction coils. Um, I, I guess I can't see if there's a person in there to get a sense of scale, but these are very, very large coils, and they're only there to null out tiny field errors in the, in the system. They're all superconducting. And now you see that the bottom right, now this is the uh, middle of last year, they have to build casings, of course, to install these coils in. And those things have to be very pre highly precision, as high precision as, as the other coil casings. And they have to be welded up. And the Chinese have developed a special high power laser welding system just to seal the structural cases of these, um, of these correction coils. And they're very well advanced. A lot of the bottom coils, are, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but many of the bottom coils are done, top coils are well underway, and they've already started building prototypes of the big side coils. So they, of course, are going in a bit later because they're the things you put on once you start, once you've uh, assembled the machine. So um, let's move to the vacuum vessel. I, I'm running a bit short of time, but I think we'll be okay. Um, this is a truly impressive beast. This is the biggest Takimak vacuum vessel ever constructed, which is normal because ITER is the biggest machine ever constructed. This is a double-walled vessel. It's not easy to see here, but you can sort of see here the double walls. And you would think, okay, this, what's the double wall for? It's to pass the coolant through, because you have to cool this vacuum vessel 
all the time. In fact, cooling is the wrong word. It's actually heated. It sits at about 100 degrees C. But it's there to, to absorb neutron energy, which is not absorbed by the blanket. You have to keep it cool all the time. So you have to have water flowing through it. But it's also full of other stuff. It's full of ferritic inserts that, and, that cancel out or at least reduce the ripple, right? You have a, a machine, you've heard about toroidal field ripple, right? No? Yes? Don't see any heads nodding. Are you all at the end of your... You're completely exhausted. Yeah. Ripple, you have 18 toroidal field coils, but you would like a purely uniform toroidal field, but you cannot because it's not a continuous solenoid. So you have coil, 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 and the field oscillates in and out, in and out. But it's tiny, the oscillation. It's of the order of half a percent, or one percent of the toroidal field itself. But the plasma doesn't like it. Fast particles don't like it. They're sensitive to these changes in the field gradients. So uh, you have to do your best to get the ripple down. And what you do is you insert in this double-walled vacuum vessel, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you insert ferritic iron, soft, soft iron, which itself creates a steady field, which n cancels out some of that. Uh, the fact that the toroidal field is higher at the coil, then not so high in between the coils, then high at the coil, right? And there's also all kinds of shielding plates stuck in there. It's, it's a very, very complex thing. And they're in the vacuum vessel itself. You can't really see it here, but you know, literally. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of big holes formed so that you can, project, you can make housings for structures that will allow you to connect your blanket to the vacuum vessel wall. And it's an incredibly complex piece of equipment. And it's the critical item of ITER. This is the critical path item. Without the vacuum vessel, of course, you can't install anything else. And there's been a lot of, shall we say, difficulties getting going, lots of technical issues to resolve. Uh, but now, finally, we're on a very good track with the vacuum vessel. And the other thing that's interesting about this is that it has to sit at very low base pressure because this is a UHV chamber. You can't start a tokamak up if the vacuum level is too bad in the machine, if there are too many impurities. Tokamaks don't like, plasmas don't like too much impurity. So you have to bake this down to very, very low levels of pressure. We target 5, 10 to the minus 8 millibar, but I don't think we will get that low. It's very, very hard at this, uh, at this scale. But uh, nevertheless, it has to be a UHV system. There's protocols for how you prepare the vessel, how you prepare anything that goes in the vessel so that you maintain this UHV uh, environment. Uh, very, very complicated. So that's the vacuum vessel in CAD drawing with all the port structures sitting on it. It weighs about 25% less than the Eiffel Tower. I bring this up simply because it's built in France. So. Well, the Eiffel Tower is a pretty iconic thing in France, right? There she is, 7,300 tons, um, and it's about 25% less. But if you put all the things inside the vacuum vessel, like the blanket, it weighs more than the Eiffel Tower. Of course, it's a bit smaller. Um, this is like, you know, 25 meters, this is 324. Actually, an interesting thing about the Eiffel Tower, imagine you have a toilet roll. Yeah, a toilet roll, an empty toilet roll but you make one big enough to be the Eiffel Tower. So you put the toilet roll on top of the Eiffel Tower and fully enclose it. You calculate the mass of the air inside that toilet roll. It's the same as the mass of the Eiffel Tower within a few hundred tons. Very interesting, isn't it? That, no, I thought it was. But the problem is if you put a big toilet roll on top of the Eiffel Tower, then nobody can see it anymore, right? Sadly. But it's an amazing structure, if you think about it, the way he built it and designed it, that it doesn't weigh that much because the air around it weighs the same. So here's a, a, a bit about vacuum vessel procurement. Um, so these are all the different key bits of the vacuum vessel, the sectors themselves, the upper ports, which, which are welded on to the top of the sectors, the mid-plane ports that are welded to the middle, and the lower ports, which carry all kinds of equipment, cryo pumps, cables, give you remote handling access to the diverter area and so on. And then the inner wall shield, which is another line of defense to keep the toroidal fields cold, coils cold. You need shielding inside this. You, need, you have a big cryostat, which we'll get to in a minute. You have shielding inside the cryostat to shield the, uh, the, the toroidal field coils from the heat coming from the vacuum vessel. And then you have another shield on top of the, right on top of the vacuum vessel, which is your first thermal shield. And all these things are very complex and very large and are being supplied by different people. So the EU uh, doing five of the vacuum vessel sectors, South Korea is doing four, and uh, the equatorial and lower ports. India is doing the inner wall thermal shield and Russia is doing the top ports. 
but each of these company, countries is subcontracting others to do various bits because it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated. Now, this is by, f I think, the largest in-kind cost of the, of the ITER machine itself. It's about 8% of the total. There's the number in kilo ITER units of account. So this is our big jewel in the crown. This one costs the most, is the hardest to build, and has to be right. And so you see, hot off the press, 9th of September, there's the first one, first sector built in Korea. It's a major, major milestone for the ESA project. Uh, that, that such a thing was possible to the precision necessary. And they've been making all kinds of thousands of metrological measurements to see just how precise it is. And I can tell you that, as far as I can see from the colleagues, it's within spec, which you may have heard lots of people saying the ITER vacuum vessel won't work, it's not in spec, they can't build it, it's impossible. And it's not true, it is. And there's the first sector. This is now in uh, HHI, Hyundai Heavy Industries, in South Korea. And you see they're building this big encasing structure now that they will bring around it to start doing all the other bits and pieces they have to do in there. Um, because it has to, it's a clean component, it has to be kept as clean as possible. And you can get an idea of the scale for the chappies standing on the little uh, levitating platform there. And so what you're seeing is the, is, the, is the, my mouse doesn't work, you're seeing the red, yellow, blue, and green components, and then the, the port extensions, uh, there are a couple of examples here, they're coming separately, and they will be welded onto the vacuum vessel. Um, and there's one of them, actually. That's uh, one of the uh, upper port uh, extensions. There are 18 of those supplied by the Russian Federation, and this one is being produced in Germany, and they're coming off the production line now. They're very big things that are themselves enormous. You can walk in through them, uh, and they have to be welded to the vacuum vessel. Um, so let's talk about the main heat shield, the inner heat shield. This is the thing that stops the uh, superconducting magnets from overheating, because it's a very hot environment in there. You have this nuclear plasma with a hot vacuum vessel, neutrons all over the place, and all of that sitting uh, you know, next to toroidal fuel coils, which are at liquid helium temperature. So the gradients of temperature are quite spectacular. Um, this thing is an amazing structure all on its own. This is the inner heat shield that goes, you'll see it, uh, I, sh I showed it to you in an earlier picture, but I forgot to highlight it. Um, we, it's, it sits all the way around the vacuum vessel, but outside the inner, inner heat shield, and stops the heat from getting to the toroidal fuel coils inside the cryostat. This on its own is full of, is a, is a thick structure, but it's hollow. There are pipes in there because you have to circulate helium gas at 80 Kelvin, right? You want to keep this nice and cold. So this is, a, um, uh, this is you know, at liquid nitrogen temperature. And you have to coat the plates of this thing with silver to improve the emissivity so it does its job more efficiently. And you can see how big it is. We've got our chappy down here. Um, and this, on its own, is a major manufacturing uh, achievement. And it's being done in South Korea. This is a photograph from October 2017 where you see all the different bits of the heat shield in this enormous factory. And then, then when you've got those things, you have to go into a huge coating production line where you literally just dip these things in various baths and coat them. It's, it's kind of electroplating on a massive scale. And they had to develop special systems for this. Beg your pardon, my phone's trying to talk to me. And there's one bit. This is from May 2019. This one ready for shipping now. Um, and uh, they're, they're doing all the others. This thing is very advanced. It's almost complete. So that's the inner thermal shield. And now to the cryostat, the big container inside which the whole the whole tokamak sits. Again, you need a cryostat because you've got to keep convective heat transfer down. You don't want, so you're going to evacuate this cryostat down to about 10 to the minus 4 millibar. So it's, it's a vacuum chamber, not as good vacuum as the, uh, the UHV chamber in the middle, which is the tokamak vacuum chamber. But this is a truly gargantuan structure. It's enormous. If you go and see the bits they're making on the ITER site now, it's breathtaking. And they are made of all different panels that are shipped separately. There are, I think, 54 of them because they have to ship the bits that can be transported by road when they get to France. They can't make this thing in India, which is where it's procured, and then just ship it to Eta because you could never get it from the boat. Supposing you could get it on a boat, you can't get it to the machine. So it has to be assembled on site in a special uh, room for that. And this very thick, 40 to 180 millimeters thick, with all kinds of port structures that will come later. And the vacuum vessel sits in there, interfaces to this structure. So all the vacuum vessel port extensions connect to this cryostat. 
very, very impressive. It weighs 4,000 tons. And it's built in four sectors. So each of these bits is built from sub-bits, which are separately shipped. And, and then you put this bit on top of this one, that one on top of this one, and then the lid. Boom, from the top. Well, it's not so easy because it's a big lid. Yeah? And that's your only way of access in there later if you have to. You open up the bio shield and you get in through the lid, if you ever had to. Hopefully you don't. Um, and this is the thing that transfers the tokamak loads to the floor of the bio shield of the tokamak pit. We'll see that in a moment. Um, and uh, that bottom bit is in there. And that building is the cryostat building where all these bits were separately assembled. Yeah? And now it's got a nice dress on because it's too big to stay in there because they can't build the other bit while well, that bit's in there. So they finish that and now they pull it out. They have pulled it out on these special uh, transporter wheels. That was a very impressive operation. Uh, and now it's outside in the Provence sunshine and the rain and all the wind and everything. And it will sit there until it's ready to be installed, which is not so far away. Um, I think this photograph, 12th of March. So this was earlier this year. And there he is, she, in whatever gender it is, sitting outside the cryostat building on its little support legs, waiting patiently to be installed. And actually just that wrapping around it looks like an enormous Christmas present, but that was a very complex operation uh, on its own. And meanwhile, uh, inside the cryostat building, they've just finished the base bit, the bit at the bottom. And it's obvious that that's the first bit in, right? Because then all the other bits go on top and the whole machine goes on top of that. So it's important to get this one done. This is in July this year. And so uh, it is now formally received by the ITER organization. And then it stays in the building now, in the big cryostat building, until it's ready to be installed. And next to it, they'll start building the upper level uh, of the cryostat. I want to take a, a step back and talk about power exhaust because I'm going to introduce you to the blanket. And so uh, let's focus on the inside of the vessel. Uh, on the right hand side you see the poloidal cross section of the ETA magnetic equilibrium for the baseline Q equals 10 plasma at a safety factor Q95 of 3, uh, 15 megamperes, 5.3 tesla. So this thing is burning, imagine, and we have 50 megawatts in, 500 megawatts of fusion power, 100 megawatts of alpha power. If everything goes to plan, we've got our alphas because we're making fusion. Uh, we're going to radiate in the core, line emission, bremsstrahlung mostly. We're going to radiate about 30 megawatts, and we're going to have 400 megawatts of neutrons. And they just go straight out, not charged. They don't care about magnetic fields, and they get deposited in our blanket. And then, so there they go, the 400 megawatts of neutrons. And then that leaves, if you do a simple power balance, Input power plus alphas minus radiative power is about 100 to 120 megawatts of power, and that's coming out to the edge plasma, and that's just pure thermal waste. Keeps, it's, the plasma has to stay hot to be fusing, so the core has to be hot, but you're, only, you're not making use of all the energy you produce. The plasma gets hot, and it has to get that energy out. And so it just comes out, and you've got to deal with it. Now, in a reactor, you'll get much more than 120 megawatts, and you will use that power in the plant. You won't just let it come out and dump it on surfaces and then heat exchange it away. You, uh, you, you have to use it because it's part of the energy produced by the plasma. But that 120 megawatts comes through the plasma in the edge, hits the walls and the diverter at the bottom of the machine, and we've got to deal with it. So there's the blanket. It's a sort of standalone CAD of the blanket. There are 440 of these massive steel modules and each of these is gun drilled with hundreds of cooling water pipes and water is flowing through these things, driven, supplied by a manifold that sits on the vacuum vessel and it's all extremely complicated uh, and very heavy. Um, and then down at the bottom here, you see the man standing on this little dome area. This is the diverter. This is where 90% of the thermal plasma power will be deposited that, uh, that, is, that is being exhausted to the edge. And, well, the blanket modules, I uh, won't waste too much time on here, but you see at the top left, they're massive steel structures, and on the front, there's a special panel, which is itself is a highly complex object, which is taking years to develop. And this is made up of beryllium tiles, so that the, the plasma surface, the main chamber is around, uh, I don't know, about 650 square meters of surface area. That's the thing the plasma sees primarily. And you need to make that out of a material which will not contaminate the plasma too much if you release impurities from it. So we start with low Z beryllium, which is you know, not so bad as a contaminant for the plasma if, if the wall interactions are too intense. And these 
shield blocks, the steel structures behind are made in China and Korea, 50-50, and the first wall panels are being built in China, uh, European Union and Russia, and each country is developing its own fabrication techniques to bond this beryllium to the substrate so that the water cooling works and everything, it's very, very complicated and difficult. The diverter is this huge structure at the bottom of the machine. I'm showing you three cassettes here, one, two, three, and there are 54 altogether that form the full diverter structure at the bottom of the machine. Each one of those individual cassettes uh, is about nine tons, and this is carrying uh, plasma facing components which are made up of tungsten. So tungsten in the diverter because it's high, it's a high tolerant material for heat flux, it has a very high melting temperature, um, uh, it's the most, the, 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 shall we say, the most resilient material that we know for high heat flux handling, but tungsten is very difficult because if you release it and it gets into the plasma it's a very bad contaminant. It's got large numbers of electrons and it radiates a lot of power in the main plasma. So you have to keep the tungsten erosion very, very low. And how the diverter does that is a whole series of other lectures that we could give and presumably you heard about a little bit this week. So from the point of view of manufacturing, the, I, mentioned, I showed you on the slide but I didn't say it, but the, the inner target here, this is the one that's on the high field side, that's being made by the Europeans. The outer one, where most of the power will go, is made by the Japanese and they're making big strides now in the, in the prototyping and of these things. You see the inner one here, all the little individual tungsten monoblocks you see in the, in the structure. That prototype is now, was then tested in an enormous electron beam facility which hits the tungsten with high power electron beams to heat it up to the kind of heat fluxes that it will receive in the tokamak itself. So we had to build an entire diverter test facility in St. Petersburg just to be able to test these components and qualify them when they're manufactured. You see some of the Russian colleagues very happy because they've got an inner target from Europe and they've just tested it and everything was fine. That's a prototype. In Japan they've also made prototypes. The testing of that is all okay and we're getting into procurement and manufacture now. But these things have to have a little bit more time because they're ready they, they go in only after we've done first plasma tests, which don't use these structures first. They, they will have to go in, in a, somewhere around 20, 28, 29, so we've still got about a decade. And the cassette structure on which those things fit, uh, we have full-scale prototypes of those now, and actually orders have now been placed for the first batch, 20 or so of these. We need 54, remember, plus a few spares. And so this is a very interesting thing because the water that cools the PFCs that are attached to this is flowing in the cassette body, around and through the PFCs, back out and around the cassette again. And it's very high pressure water and uh, it's all flowing at around you know, 100 degrees C. It's incredible structure. Um, I'm going to skip this because we don't have time. Plasma heating and current drive systems. ITER has to have additional heating, otherwise it's not going to get anywhere near uh, fusion plasma performance, it needs to be heated up to, to start the fusion reactions and uh, ITER is no different to any other tokamaks. It has uh, three different systems. Uh, it has electron cyclotron resonance heating, ion cyclotron resonance heating and neutral beam injection. So all these three things are present on Aztec's upgrade for example. They're present on many other devices. Not all devices have all three but several do. And all we're doing on ITER is doing that but on a much bigger scale. So you see um, EC power is coming along microwaves that are then directed into upper ports and, and an, an equatorial port um, and there'll be, um, there will be uh, 20 megawatts of this power with a, a possibility to upgrade by another 20 um, and there will be massive neutral beam injectors which are unique in the sense that they are negative ion beam sources because when you get to these very high energies of an MEV you can't make these things with positive ion sources, which is the conventional way of doing it on smaller devices. And a lot of the beam development, beam source development is done here in IPP. Uh, and then we have ion cyclotron resonance heating, which is a more conventional RF antenna, but still a highly complex system uh, to inject another 20 megawatts in the 40 to 55 megahertz range. So the ECH is operating at 170 gigahertz. Diagnostics, I mentioned these a bit earlier. They're highly complex entities on ITER because it's nuclear and so everybody has to fit in a compact place. It's not like on machines, earlier smaller machines where you have a vacuum vessel with hundreds of vacuum flanges and you can just go on providing there's a space, bolt your diagnostic directly on 
uh, if it's not a superconducting device, literally you bolt it straight on the vacuum vessel. If it's a superconductor with a cryostat, you have to bring those ports out to the cryostat entrance, and then it's a bit harder because you haven't got so much access. But nevertheless, a lot easier than here where you have just big port structures on the equatorial midplane and at the top. And basically you have a, a bunch of those going around the machine and everybody has to live happily together in these port plugs. So you can have multiple diagnostic systems supplied by multiple domestic agencies and everybody's got to be integrated into these port structures. And if something goes wrong with your system, well, that's just tough luck. Because getting those port structures out to do maintenance is already difficult enough without nuclear operation. But when the machine goes nuclear and you want to take a port plug out because something went wrong in your system, well, you have to do this now robotically. Everything has to go to a hot cell. It's very, very difficult. So you have to design these things so that they function as well as possible for as long as possible. And you can see we have about 40 major diagnostic systems um, many of which are used for machine protection, to monitor the plasma and make sure we don't damage anything in the plasma. And it's very, very challenging to interface all these. So here's an example of a port plug. You see that all the diagnostics fit into separate drawers, one, two, three, in each equatorial port plug. And you see these little cutouts in the drawer. This is for the things to be able to see the plasma, right? So if you're an optical diagnostic, it has to look out of a tiny slot. Because if you make the hole too big, all the neutrons go in. And so your shielding blanket is not working anymore. And in fact, these things are called DSMs, Diagnostic Shield Modules, which are big chunks of steel with water flowing in them. They're a neutron barrier. And it's clear that you cannot have too many penetrations in your neutron barrier, or you let too many neutrons in, which is not good. So you have to be very careful how you design. And so basically, they're drawer systems that are all sort of in, in not re repeated units, but with as much similarity as possible. One, two, three. And then inside each one of these DSMs, there will be specific extra kit for optic mirrors, for optical mirror cleaning systems, to relay your signal from the plasma back into your diagnostic. Remote handling, just a quick word. Um, I haven't shown you all the remote handling, but here's one particular part, which is for the diverter. I mentioned all these individual cassette structures that make up the full diverter. They all have to be individually accessible and remote handleable. So you build equipment that goes through a lower port, you can see it here, comes in, and there each, you can't see it very easily here, but each of these cassettes has water cooling pipes going in and out. And in order to remove a cassette, you've got to sever the pipes or cut it. And then when you put the cassette back in, you'll have to re-weld it with orbital welding in situ by robots. And then you literally go in with your robot, you pull out the first cassette, and then shuffle them along. Right? So you've got 54. If one of them breaks, you would rather it would not be somewhere far away from your remote handling port, because you'll have to take the, all the others out first to get to it. But uh, there are these robotic systems, this is happening at VTT laboratories uh, in Finland, the robotic handling systems are very far advanced for the diverter. It's a little bit trickier for the blanket, but for the diverter, they have pretty much got to the stage where they're confident they can build the remote handling for the, for the diverter extraction and replacement. So let's move quickly to tritium. This is really key for ITER. Probably you don't know or you have not thought about it, but if you're burning uh, in, in an ITER plasma, you're not consuming much fuel, only about 0.4%. So you're putting in lots of tritium and deuterium, but you're only burning 0.4% of it, which means you've got to get it out, because it's just waste particles. But you can't just get it out and throw it up the chimney stack and release it to the atmosphere, because tritium's a nasty, <laughs> nasty stuff. And moreover, the nuclear regulations mean you have to be very, very careful how you account for it. So it's a scarce commodity. We don't burn much of it, and we have to recirculate vast amounts of it through, through the machine. It has to be taken into an enormous plant and then isotopes separated, separate the D from the T, uh, separate the H, take out any impurities there might be uh, in the stream, and then push it back in, into the system. And there's a very large tritium facility that does that. I'll show you the building in a moment. This is at least a factor of 10 bigger than the biggest thing that's ever been done for tritium handling anywhere in the world, even in the military, especially in the military. And in fact, one of our people in the tritium plant, the leader of the tritium plant division, comes from that kind of processing facility in the US. And he tells me all the time how, how big it is compared to what he's done before. On the other hand, 
Okay, I can't explain to you what all these different distillation columns are and all this kit in here. This is just a render of vaguely how it's going to look like. But it's all pretty standard technology. It's been done. Storage on uranium beds, distillation, cryo-distillation, cryo-separation. It's all been done. It just has to be done at a very large scale for us. So there's confidence it's possible, but it's not been done yet. So now, on the site, we can have at most four kilos of tritium. And that's fixed by the regulator. And there can be no more, I think, than 70 grams in any one part of the processing plant. You can't have too much tritium in one place in case there's a problem and you lose, a certain, uh, you lose too high a fraction. I just want to show this is an old plot, and maybe Hartmut, you have something more, more, more recent, but I love this plot because it, it, it gets home to you the problem of fusion, or rather the way fusion has to go. This is the available tritium. Most of it comes from CANDU reactors, nuclear fission reactors, which use heavy water and in which tritium is a byproduct, it's a waste product. And in fact, not all CANDU plants recycle the tritium, they don't extract it, but many do. And that's our main tritium supply in the world. And there's around about um, 27 kilos from 40 years of exploitation of all the can-do plants around the world. There are some in South Korea, some in India, some lots in Canada and elsewhere. Um, but of course, this tritium is decaying. It's disappearing in front of you all the time uh, with a half-life of a bit more than 12 years. And um, if you had a demo plant that was burning for a full power year, it would use about 100 kilos of the stuff. So it would use many more times tritium than there is on, on the planet. So you've got to breed it. And this plot here is interesting because it tells you, just assuming you're not breeding anything, assuming a certain amount of tritium that's available, it shows you how when you switch ETER on, the blue line, um, you, how, how fast the tritium available in the world will disappear if ETA reaches its performance goals, it will burn around 17 kilos of tritium. So that's nearly all of what we have, everywhere. And there's another big machine being prepared, they're looking at, the, they're designing with the, with the intention to build called CFETR in China, which is a very ETA-like device. It's a bit bigger, but it's pretty much similar. It, try, it will try to operate in different modes. But if it switches on, you see how the red line pulls the available tritium down still further. So they've got to do something to get more tritium, otherwise we could end up in trouble. And it's obvious that demos have to breed. And ITA's going to test uh, some aspects of that. Uh, show you here how it's going to do that. It's going to use two of the equatorial mid-plane ports on ITA will be dedicated to testing many different <coughs> concepts of tritium breeding. And I have obviously no time to even start talking about this, but there are multiple ways to do tritium breeding. There's a massive fusion technology development along these different routes that's been going on for decades. And so don't think that we don't know how to do it. It's just that I can't tell you much about it. But these two modules here will, will themselves carry two different reading systems inside these port plug structures. And then behind them is an entire forest of stuff to try and power these things, circulate fluids, and extract the tritium. And they're going to have very little tritium to extract. They're probably at best be making about a gram of it per year on ITER because we don't have very much fluence. But tritium has one beautiful thing is it can be very easily measured. You can find it very easily because it's radioactive. So um, there's no problem there. And so here's an example of the port plugs. Of course, these things are using the neutron plus lithium reaction to generate tritium, two different types. And there are many different technologies to do that. So I'm nearly there. This is the ITER site I'm going to show you. And I can only show you a fraction of what's available. If you go to that website there, it's publicly available. We have a brilliant media site. And you will see thousands of photographs of different things, much more than I can show you here. And um, I think that uh, if you're interested in ETA, you should be watching this site clear. This is the most recent overhead. We have drones flying about now all the time. We've, we've gone up in the world from balloons and various helicopter flights. We have a regular drone flight, which shows the site uh, at its different uh, points of development. You see the main uh, assembly hall, the silver building in the middle, and the, the, pre, the, the treatment hall before it for, to clean component, make sure everything's clean before it goes in there. The tokamak building you see to the right hand side. This one coming out here towards you, that's the RF building where all the power supplies and the sources for the RF and the ECRH will go. Um, so you see, uh, you have 
the magnet conversion buildings, which are just come up in the last couple of years. This is the PF winding facility, which I told you about. This is the cryogenics building. This on its own is an absolute monster thing. It's the biggest single cryogenic building of its type in the world. There's more cryogenics in CERN, for example, for the particle accelerator. There's more throughput, but it's in smaller units. We have uh, the biggest throughput uh, um, cryogenic helium building. This is the 400 kilovolt switchyard where all the power is coming in through there. Um, PF winding, this is the cryostat building. You see our friend there that I showed you earlier sitting outside patiently waiting to go in there. And here is the start of the heat treatment buildings. This is where all the waste heat will be dissipated through cooling uh, towers. You can actually see the holes here. They're not going to be like cooling towers on a power, on a power station that you see. They're going to be uh, somewhat more modern units and, and in this building. This is being built by India. This is the main HQ building where many of the IO staff have their offices. Sadly, the science division is in this one. Uh, we used to be in this one, but we got moved over there. I don't know what that tells you about the uh, opinion of scientists in, in the ITA organization. Seriously, we were moved there because there literally isn't enough space for all the people that need to come, and somebody had to go, and the decision was taken that it had to be us. But, so if you want to come for your lunch in here, it's a bit of a long hike from there to there. But there are buses to help you. So that's a, a quick overview of the, of the site. And here again is a sort of more... Uh, closer view of the real key bits. Here's the Tuckamack building, the magnet conversion buildings, the cryogenics, PF winding, cryostat, heat, treat, heat treatment building over here, RF building just sticking out there, and here's the real meat and potatoes. This is the tritium building coming up, the diagnostics building where all the diagnostic systems will be located to be able to treat the signals that come from the machine. Here's the Tuckamack building and the bioshield and the assembly hall. And I will just quickly, you can look at this later, bring up all the different things that I just told you. So here's a, a, a sort of closer view of the Tokamak concept. So this whole thing, this nuclear building, this is sitting on seismic plinths, which are way underground. This is part of the nuclear regulations. <coughs> if there's an earthquake, the whole building has to be able to sway with it and not collapse. And that's standard, pretty standard stuff for nuclear buildings in France. Uh, when I used to give this talk many years ago, I was... I used to come with photographs of the plinths and the basement because that's all we had. It was very exciting. Now I can come with the real Tuckamack building, which is even more exciting. And if we now uh, just look at a breakdown of this, you see the tritium building going up here, the diagnostics building here, the assembly hall, the big gantry crane that's bringing com that will bring the components and drop them in the pit here in the Tuckamack inside the bioshield. And I'll show you later in a few minutes how we're preparing the extension of that assembly hall to allow that to happen. So here inside the Tokamak pit, this was in February this year. And this was near the end of the construction phase of the, of the pit and the bioshield. You can see all these port entrance areas are all closed off. They've got temporary doors on. And that's because they were preparing to paint it. So you have to sandblast all the concrete first to make it, to prepare it to accept the nuclear paint that you're going to spray on it afterwards so that the ad adherence is better if it's a rough surface. So there was a lot of sandblasting going on in there, and then uh, closing everything off ready to paint. I don't think there's a person in here for you to get the scale, but if I show you the next one, there it is being, after it's been painted. And okay, it looks like a, a kind of CAD drawing or a, an illustration, but that's the real thing. And you see how it's all beautifully white now, and you can see some chappies down here, look. That gives you the scale size. And uh, you can see the crown region here where the cryostat is going to sit. And I will show you that now. This is a closer up photograph this month, so in September. And you see they're all busy at work now preparing the uh, bearings on which the cryostat will sit boom, on the top. And these are very complex steel bearings. I can't show you the, the thing in detail because the picture's not good enough and I don't have separate pictures. But there you see one that's complete and it's got a little hood on it just to protect it. So now they're going to put the other 17 of those around, around the building and then that's really the last step before the whole thing goes in. Um, this is uh, uh, the lower basement level of the, uh, of the rest of the building, so there's not the pit but all the way around it, you see that all that's now all painted beautifully with its nuclear paint. So it's ready to start receiving equipment. You see these gold structures here? These are uh, what we call embedded plates. So that these are areas where you think you will need to attach something, and these are weight-bearing. You can't, in a nuclear building, you can't just drill into the concrete and screw something in. You're not allowed to make any penetrations in the walls that you haven't previously declared. 
And all nuclear buildings are like this for fission plants. And one of the challenges early on in the ESA project was to foresee for the next 40 years where I have to put all these plates. Because when you put them in, that's it. If you haven't got a plate where you need to attach something, then you can't attach it. And so there, had to, there are tens of thousands of these around the building, and that all had to be put together. But that was one of the reasons why the buildings got a bit slow at the beginning, because we were trying to find out where to put all these plates. Now, just on the assembly, I want to show this picture, because for the last few years I've given this talk, this is all I could show you, a picture. And this is a picture of the assembly tools that you need to be able to put the sectors of the vacuum vessel here together with the toroidal fuel coils, put them together, move them into the tokamak pit, drop them down, go back out, get the next one, drop them down, and prepare everything ready to assemble the vacuum vessel, uh, the, the, the tokamak vacuum vessel. And these are humongously big structures just to assemble. And you can see the side there. And now I can show you the assembly building inside. And this is a drawing of those structures. You see, this was in, I can't remember when this was, it's about a year and a half ago. There's the, the, the bits on the floor ready to take these big structures which are built in South Korea. And they'll be the things where you put the vacuum vessel sectors together with the toroidal fuel coils before you go through that hole there and drop them into the tokamak. And now I can show you uh, the real things. They're in there now. These massive structures. You see a man down here. He's quite far away from them. But when you stand under them, they are really quite something, I have to tell you. Uh, you see them preparing this massive concrete structure which is then lifted up on this crane. And what they're going to do is ship it around to one of these um, sector assembly tools. And this thing is 350 tons in weight. And it's exactly the right center of gravity as a, as a sector will be, a vacuum vessel sector with the TF coils. You see all the work they have to do just to lift this plumbing thing? And then it's going to shuttle over there really quickly in this video. But of course, it took much longer. See it? Oof, it's going to go all the way down the assembly building and then shuttle along there. And the bit I like about this is that when they get to the end, this humongous 350 ton structure, the guys are just pushing it around like it's hilarious. <laughs> and they're, they're gonna insert that in, into the, into the thing. They're gonna attach it, uh, put it on the base uh, support structure of the assembly tool, you see? And then that, that's effectively a proxy for what a real vacuum vessel sector will look like. And then you'll see a guy come up in a crane here. Look, this is really funny. Uh, and I don't know what he was doing, but, and there's somebody doing some bolting up there. But anyway, there you go. So that was the video. And now the last two slides of the construction. I mentioned to you that this assembly hall, the crane that's in this assembly hall has to come out and drop things into the tokamak pit. Of course, it can't do that yet because it has no rails to move on. So that's what they're building now. They're building the rails on the other side of this uh, diagnostic building and there's another set of rails going off on the other side at the tritium building and then this will allow them to continue the assembly hall and there'll be another roof coming up on top to extend the assembly hall and you see putting one of these pillars in this was just uh, a few days ago and then they drop it down onto the concrete and you can see them doing that just here that's the first one dropped on and they're going to be another nine coming along here oh sorry Hartman I nearly <laughs> took your eyes out there uh, with my laser pen and then uh, this will support the roof of the, of the assembly hall extension and the gantry crane will move along and be able to drop lift components in. So just the last point on transport, I mentioned these components are large. You have to get them from the port area in Marseille where they come in and then get them on the road. And they had to do an awful lot of things on this road from this is the, what's called the Berre d'Etang and this is Fosse sur Mer. So this is the ocean here, the Mediterranean. And then once they come uh, through uh, this canal, they go across the, the Berletan, and then uh, they follow the road all the way to Calarache. And there was an awful lot of money and time spent just making that itinerary possible for these very large components to be transported. And it takes like a day or two to get them there, because they can only go in the evenings usually, and they go very slowly. Uh, and there's an example of some power transformers that came from China and Korea recently. Uh, last year or so, and you see them coming through the canal in Martigues out into the Berletan, uh, and this is this, this, this is this region here. Yeah? It's quite impressive to see this. So, last word. <laughs> because you're all young and you're all dying to get involved in ITER in the longer term, so this is my little slide which tells you, well, how can you do that? And um, in the years up to the end of construction, it's pretty difficult to come and work at ITER because we don't, we're not academic, we don't have 
it's not so easy to, to sponsor students and work with you because we have too many things to do to support the engineering groups and get ready for the plasmas. But, so the best way if you're wanting to get involved is to go through the members' facilities. IPP Garshing is a brilliant example. This is a fabulous place to work to prepare yourself for, for the future on a machine like ETA. Do your PhD, do your postdoc, do a bit of R&D, get yourself senior enough to be in place ready for when this thing switches on. Um, and that's the same for engineers and for physicists. Um, we only will employ a handful of people in, we, <laughs> with only 18 people in the science division. We will grow maybe by a factor of, let's say, two and a half, even three in the next five to six years, but there will not be exciting research positions. There'll be, you know, how to make the integrated modeling analysis suite work, how to get the plasma control system working, how to make the first demonstration plasma, which is really not much of a plasma at all. Um, there are Monaco fellowships, which uh, are five two-year postdocs available each two years. And these are uh, paid for by the Principality of Monaco, by uh, Prince Albert, so highly prestigious things. The competition is very high for these. We typically have 90 to 100 applicants each cycle. And you must be within two years of your PhD if you, when you apply. In other words, you must not be two years further than your PhD time when you apply. Uh, and the next cycle will start towards the end of this year. We'll start advertising for the candidates and uh, people would start in September next year, roughly. Uh, we have lots of internships. We have an example sat right here who's just done one, a very successful one, I have to say. Thank you. And uh, I think you will be able to tell them that it's not such a bad place to do an internship. Yeah. Right. And we have lots of different projects. Uh, I will run some myself. Colleagues will run different ones across the board of plasma physics. And, uh, and numerical science, computational work. There are lots of options. They're advertised on the website, but they're not really for PhD students, really. They're for undergraduates and, and masters at best. And we have a few collaborative PhD opportunities. We have five or six PhD students that we are sponsoring right now at 50%. They work half the time with us, uh, but usually in their home labs, but we supervise them as well. But that number is not great because we don't have much money. And when finally you get there and we are ready to operate, this machine, I hope, will become the focus of worldwide magnetic fusion research. It will be the place to be. And, uh, and there will be a very large demand for people like you with your expertise. So keep your eye on the uh, project. And the last word would be to say that we are making big progress. So hang on in there. And this is a view of a guy sat in one of the big cranes and looking down on the Tokamak building. And by the last metric, we were about 63% constructed ready for first plasma. So the project is moving very fast. So it's no longer a thing that might happen, it's a thing that is happening. So thank you for your attention. Sorry for being so long. <laughs>